Good afternoon. On behalf of Father Jenkins and the members of the President's Oversight Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone, students, faculty, staff, special guests, and friends, to this Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Luncheon. We are also delighted to welcome those viewing this via live stream at our campus dining halls and elsewhere. I want to begin by thanking the Voices of Faith Gospel Choir, led by their president, Geraldine Smith, for providing the beautiful musical prelude to today's luncheon. Founded in 1977, Voices of Faith is a faith-based, student-led organization with the purpose of ministry and praise. Please join me in thanking them again with a round of applause. Today's luncheon is part of Notre Dame's third annual Walk the Walk Week. As you know, this luncheon and the numerous campus events planned during Walk the Walk Week, including the late night prayer service in the rotunda of the main building, an array of campus lectures and workshops, exhibits and performances, are all designed to be occasions when we come together to reflect more deeply on who we are as a community. These are also critically important opportunities to participate in the national and global conversations about diversity and, inclusions, and inclusion, conversations that are as important now as ever. In 1965, Dr. King said these words, but the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption, the end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. Dr. King is describing the kind of community we seek to be at Notre Dame one that recognizes the dignity of every member, welcomes each person fully, treasures their gifts as a reflection of God, supports them, and shares their struggles. As an academic community, we strive to explore, discuss, and celebrate differences as well as commonalities, thus enriching our grasp of truth and understanding. As we gather today, let us reflect on these larger goals and consider how we, as individuals and as a community, can embody this vision ever more fully. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Hasnia Samadi to offer our invocation. Hasnia is a sophomore living in Breen Phillips, a pre-dentistry major. She's from Long Island, New York, and she serves as president of the Muslim Student Association. Please join me in wel welcoming Hasnia. Good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to be here today. I just wanted to take this time to share a few prayers with you all that I feel really capture what this luncheon is all about. I'll recite two verses from two different surahs of the Quran in Arabic and then briefly go over the translation in English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu kunu kawamina bil kisti shuhada lillahi walau Allah and Pusikum, Awi Awal Daini, Wal Akrabin in Yakun Ranian, Aw Fakiran, Fa Allahu, Awla Bihima, Fala Tatabu Al Hawa and Tatilu, Wa in Tawu, Aw Duhridu, Fa Ina Allaha, Kanam Bima, Tahmeluna Haubiro. Inna ladina amanu, wa ladina hadu, wa nasara wa sabina man amana bilahi, wa yamil akhiri wa amila salihan, falahum ajrahum, inda rabihim, wa la khafun, 
alayhim walahum yahzanun. Amin. The first surah I recited speaks of justice, the justice in which all believers should stand firm in. We shall act as the witnesses for God, even if it be against our own proclivities, against those of our parents or those of any relatives. So follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just, for God is always watching. The second surah I wanted to mention today because it speaks of this justice for all of God's children. It states, those with faith, whether one be Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Catholic, Sabian, whatever religious affiliation you may have, all who believe in God, the last day, and act rightly, will have the reward with their Lord. They will feel no fear and will know no sorrow. Again, I'm very honored to be here today, and I would like to end off asking of you all to keep in mind Islam among all faiths is one that encompasses peace and love. And I ask of you all today to keep this peace and love in all of your hearts for we are all the children of God. Thank you. Thank you, Hosnia, for the beautiful prayer. In just a moment, we'll invite everyone to enjoy lunch, but I have just a few announcements before we do so. As you can see, today we have opted for box lunches and self-serve soup at your tables instead of a plated meal. These choices are intentional as they allow many more of our colleagues, most especially those who are part of campus dining, to, to be seated and participate fully in today's conversation. Of course, there are still some of our campus dining colleagues who will be hard at work during lunch, and we are deeply grateful to them. Also at this lunch, as there is with any large event, there will be some unused meals. In addition to simplifying the serving of today's meal, the box lunch format will make it easier for the unused meals to be transported to the Center for the Homeless and Hope Ministries by the ND student chapter of Food Rescue US, an organization dedicated to providing food for all, which facilitates the transfer of fresh food that would have otherwise been discarded to food insecure families. I also want to mention that the boxes for our lunches and various utensils are made entirely from recycled materials and will again be recycled thanks to a partnership from Campus Dining and the Office of Sustainability. As a final note, for those with dietary restrictions or preferences, the vegetarian box lunch is also allergen free. Additional vegetarian meals are available from the Campus Dining team at the allergen free stand near gate two. Now please enjoy lunch, and we look forward to resuming the program shortly. Please continue to enjoy your meal as I, as I introduce our next segment. We recently asked members of our campus community to reflect upon Dr. King's legacy and on what they do each day to bring his legacy to life at Notre Dame. Each of us has a vital role to play in creating a welcoming, inclusive environment in our classrooms, residence halls, offices, labs, studios, and athletic fields. As Father Jenkins has said, either we walk together in mutual support or we do not walk at all. Either we are all Notre Dame or none of us are. As you'll hear, our colleagues and friends acknowledge that it's not always easy to walk the walk and that we aren't perfect as a community. As we listen to them share how they participate in and advance Dr. King's legacy, perhaps we might reflect on these questions for ourselves as well. Let's listen. I understood Dr. King to set his legacy as being a pioneer in a topic that a lot of people didn't want to talk about, but everybody felt. There was a lot of tension and there was a lot of problems, but he decided to address the issue. And as for me on campus, 
I like to address the issues that are still going on. There's still ripple effects, and I like to talk to my fellow peers about it in the classroom and even talk to my professors about it. I went to Notre Dame as an undergraduate, and then I went to law school. And for me, the question was, how can I use my gifts to advance God-given human dignity? And so the, what I try to do as a law professor and what I did as a lawyer was to use the tools of law and justice to advance the dignity of every human person. As the president of the Vietnamese Student Association, I see that it's really easy to think of your problems as your group's problems and a different groups as their groups. But working together and thinking of all the problems as human problems and people problems and doing your best to solve them together is much better. I think he was a great advocate for all sorts of minorities, not only black people, but for example, in 1962, he came to Puerto Rico and he talked about the problem with colonialism and being dominated by political parties and the ra racism in Latin America and the Caribbean, which not a lot of people talk about. Um, and I think it's a great like inspiration to keep fighting but um, for our rights, for our freedom, but in a way that, and perhaps that is his biggest legacy for me, um, to keep fighting peacefully, with respect, with love. He was a man who clearly had reflected on the scriptures, a man who deeply cared about what those scriptures led him to. And as a priest, certainly, as someone who's tasked with preaching on this campus, I think about how is it that I can bring those very same words to life. But more practically for us all, how is it that we can be invited into those same words, into those same um, texts that are so sacred that led Dr. King to imagine a world that could be, to imagine a world that all of us can work toward? I believe Dr. Uh, King wanted all of us to be unified. He wanted us to be one. In order for us to be one, I believe he wanted us to interact with everybody. So me, per se, working at the University of Notre Dame, I interact with the students, my co-workers, or just people that just come off the street in the public to eat, you know, and I show forth love to them because that's what they, um, they need, just like I need love. I tell my students that what we've done, you know, on a particular semester is really just the beginning. I'm trying to give them the tools so that they can go out there and keep asking questions, keep learning. I choose to work with Diversity Council because I believe there is diversity on campus, but there isn't much exposure to it. Um, we have so many uh, cultural clubs like Asian Allure, Latinx, and Black Images, and those shows really help spark conversation on campus, and I think that's what is important for our campus to like keep moving, keep growing, and keep uh, learning about what needs to be fixed and for us to address those things that need to be changed. I don't think we are a high and bi culture. I think we should really fully support everybody that comes here just because we are united under the same, the same mother and our name and the legacy that we carry. I think it's all of our goals to make sure that we are really challenging each other to really think about different perspectives as well as push to make sure everybody feels welcome because if they don't, if everybody doesn't have a shot at succeeding here, we're or feeling welcome, or feeling happier, then we're not doing our job as Notre Dame. At this stage in our history in America, all people of goodwill need to stand up and speak out in favor of human dignity. That is the message of the world, for the world, and that is the message of Dr. Martin Luther King. I see uh, Dr. King's legacy really is one of equality, of trying to have everyone have equal opportunity, equal chances of success. To me, that's the same as our nation. They go hand in hand, and to give that up would totally redefine who we are as a person. I've drawn some of King's language in some of my own research, and I want to read a little bit. America has given Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe the Bank of Justice is bankrupt, end quote. I think that language tells us a lot about what had to be done in the past and what still remains to be done. I try to make a special effort to reach out to people that are on the margins. And those would be students who might be economically poor, students who are different ethnic or racially, and students who might have a different sexual orientation. Um, I'm not looking for a prize for this. It's what I feel called to do. And, uh, and I myself am changed by the experience. It doesn't matter how, where you come from, 
you have to treat each other uh, from with respect, kindness, and love each other like you loving family. I'm a first generation college student, college graduate, having grown up in a small mining town in Pennsylvania. It was very clear to me and to my family that higher education was the great vehicle for social change and social opportunity. Dr. King reminded us that that access was not always equally available. The exciting part of my work here at Notre Dame is I get to help students find that opportunity, create that opportunity, and have them come here and enjoy the benefits of a terrific education. So the biggest role that we can all play in caring for it, Dr. King's legacy is engaging in these conversations on campus, uh, whether it be in class or participating in Walk the Walk Week or just with our friends in our uh, groups here, just finding the time and the place to have these conversations, ask questions and engage one another. We try to provide opportunities for students of different ideologies to sit at the table and have a conversation that challenges each other in not a disrespectful way, but really pushing us to say why is it that we believe what we believe. A lot of times the messages we get are ingrained in us because of family and friends and their experiences, but being open to experiences that we have and don't automatically judge people because of what we've seen or the stereotypes that we've heard, but actually to meet them where they are and then walk the journey with them through life. It's now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage the 17th president of the university, Father John Jenkins. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being here uh, today. It's so encouraging to see you all here. Over uh, for Christmas, um, Dr. Hugh Page was very generous to give many of his colleagues a collection of essays and poems by the acclaimed American, African-American theologian Howard Thurman. In addition to authoring 20 books and holding a number of prestigious academic posts, Thurman, who met Gandhi in 1949, would later serve as a spiritual mentor to Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Hate, Thurman wrote, is the last great fortress of the weak. Thurman, a pacifist, understood the subversive power of Christ's love. So, of course, did King. He said, quote, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. That is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil, triumphant. For King, these words would be prophetic. However, few could see, see them with such clarity as he did. When fellow clergy failed to endorse the, endorse the boycott of Birmingham's segregated public bus system, King reacted, quote, all too many have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. King was then 26 years old. Nearly a decade later, he would be angered again by fellow clergy who condemned civil dis disobedience, praised the Birmingham police, and counseled that, with patience, progress would be made. In a now famous letter from a Birmingham jail, King replied that, quote, time itself is neutral. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of people willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. 
It is in the spirit of resisting social stagnation that we suspend classes today and come together to reflect on King, the King legacy and on the ways in which we may continue to make progress in our community and in our world. King worried that despite the technological advances in the West, which today are far greater than when he was alive, we have not made progress as a human community. In accepting the Nobel Prize 54 years ago, King said that we had, quote, produced machines that think and instruments that peer into the unfathomable ranges of interstellar space, Yet in spite of these spectacular strides in science and technology, something basic is missing. There is a sort of poverty of spirit which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. The richer we have become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly like birds, and swim like in the sea like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as sisters and brothers. My plea to you today is to, is to contemplate, and then as we leave, to act in ways big and small, to learn better the simple art of living as sisters and brothers. In, do, in doing so, we will live life more fully and more justly. We will be a richer community and we will fulfill the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And now it's my genuine delight to welcome two very special guests to help us in our reflection in this community on these important themes. From the Naval Academy class of 1987 and from the Notre Dame class of 2017, this father and son team have achieved excellence academically, athletically, and even more importantly, in the far more complicated business of being outstanding, thoughtful human beings. Let us give the warmest Notre Dame welcome to David and Corey Robinson. All right. Wow. <laughs> well, I, uh, it's hard to follow that up. I'm, I'm not nearly as eloquent as the speakers we had today, but thank you so much for having my dad and I here. It's an honor and a pleasure. I remember when I was sitting back there just a couple years ago, and then now, seven months later, I'm here with you, Dad, so it's an <laughs> honor. Thank you. Today, my dad and I want to talk to you a little bit about our next step as a Robinson family, as a Notre Dame family, and as a nation. I don't think you can really talk about anything as a universal without becoming personal. So we're going to dive a little bit into our background and our family history and show you what we've done and hopefully you know, what we've come to the realization of what our motivations are and where we hope to go. And our legacy that we hope to lead, and at two different stages in our lives. I'm a recent graduate, moved to a new city, um, to start a new job. I'm trying to balance social life and with work demands and community involvement, and dad is mid-career. He just finished an unbelievable career, um, career in basketball, and now he's doing business and philanthropy, and he can leverage his impact for social change. So the first question I want to ask you, dad, is what does Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, uh, legacy mean to you? Well, um First of all, I'm just I'm thrilled to be here. I love coming back to Notre Dame. This has been such a great uh, part of our family. Uh, and, and I certainly feel like part of the family today because uh, the, uh, I had a little bit of a challenge traveling here yesterday and the basketball office sent over some clothes. <laughs> so thank you, basketball office. I appreciate that. I can see the challenges that Mike Gray has right now. He doesn't have anybody that has enough clothes for me. So. So let's pray for Mike Bray. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Martin Luther King is um, really a, a, an icon. Um, and for me, he is a perfect picture of a, of a man who, motivated by his faith, 
stepped out into the world and moved, made a difference, and he practiced grace and mercy. And, and that's my challenge, really, to my boys, to myself every day, practice grace and mercy. Those are two things I think we're having a lot of trouble with now in this country. Obviously, um, the challenges, you know, politically, just talking, uh, just getting on the same page, working together. It's, uh, it's been a challenge, and, um, and I think if we practice grace and mercy a little more, uh, like Dr. King, I think we'd be in good shape. You know, I'm a PLS guy, so I'm all about theory and in practice. Grace and mercy are two abstract concepts, right, that I can debate for days with all of my classmates. But I'm interested to know, Dad, what does that look like in practice? Your grandparents, my grandparents, your, your parents grew up in 1939, 1942, Arkansas and South Carolina. I mean, did, did you get an exposure to their background in segregated America coming up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny, he's the, he's the philosopher, I'm the engineer. I, <laughs> I think grace and mercy mean one thing. I don't know how you debate it, but uh, <laughs> see, uh, you know, to me, grace is, is just kindness given to somebody who, they, who doesn't deserve it. It's a simple thing. You give kindness to people even though they don't deserve it. We practice grace, right? And that's, I think that's an important, valuable aspect of our lives. And then mercy is not punishing somebody for something they actually do deserve. And, uh, and that's obviously another concept that's a challenge, right? Someone offends us, how do we let that go? And how do we move on? And, and so those, those two things I think are, are really key. And I, you know, growing up, that was, that, the whole mercy thing was, a, it's a huge deal because my father grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas in the 1950s. Uh, he was going to high school there at uh, Boris Mann High School. And, and Actually, when they chose the Little Rock Nine to be integrated into Central High School, he was one of the kids they asked, would you like to do that? And, and he turned it down. He said, no, 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 I'm fine. Thank you. I want to stay at Horace Mann. But, um, but, you know, that growing up in that time period was an interesting challenge because, in, I mean, if you guys know the story, I think out of those nine kids, one of those kids actually graduated. Um, and, and all kinds of horrible incidents happened to some of the other kids. And... Um, and it was just, a, in 1958, the governor came in and said, you know, we're shutting down all the schools here because we don't want to integrate the schools. And so growing up in that atmosphere, that's, that's the, that was the lens my father had. Yeah, and he, he could have played basketball in college, if I understand correctly, at the University of Arkansas. But then they said that you at had Tuskegee, to have... yeah. No, but you had to have different um, accommodations as the white players, so then he chose to go to Tuskegee instead. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of different background that I'm, I'm curious, did he show you that side of, I grew up in this tense, incredibly difficult environment growing up, or did he shelter you from that and say, you can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want to. Don't look at race as a lens, but as, a, as an opportunity to show mercy and grace to others. Yeah, no, he, you know, he didn't shelter me from it. I, and I, I saw it. My mother grew up in, in Columbia, South Carolina. A similar thing. She got bused across town to the black school, and um, and she spent her childhood really fighting a lot because her her brother was uh, mentally handicapped and got made fun of a lot. And so my mom is a fighter. That's what she is. And so um, for both of them to grow up in a, in an environment where people told them they couldn't do things, that they literally weren't capable of doing things, and to raise me thinking I can do anything. They, I, I never felt a limitation. And even though a lot of the places that I went, um, I would go into, uh, I mean, for example, I'd go to Little Rock, Arkansas and go visit my family. And I always wondered why my cousins all had issues. They had drama in their lives. And, and I, I always thought to myself, you know, it's the environment, the neighborhoods, it was so oppressive. And it's hard to get out of that mindset. And it made me appreciate even more how my father got out of that mindset and he enlisted in the Navy and he got away from all of that stuff. And, he, and then he, he raised three kids who all got their degrees. My sister got her PhD. My brother got his, his degree from the uh, Naval Academy and went to be a pastor. Now he's a pastor for 20 years. And, and I, I got my degree in the, from the Naval Academy and I went on and got my master's. And, and doing business now. And so for my mom and dad to grow up in those environments and, and, and raise these children who 
feel no limitations. We, we feel like we could, and, and now I have kids who think they can do even more. And that's, that to me is exciting. And the, the fact that, you know, that's mercy, right? Mm -hmm. That's not holding anything against, yeah, so my dad wouldn't go to school because it was segregated. Um, but he, I never felt that angst. Mm -hmm. he, he never made me live that with yeah. him. And that's mercy played out over generations. One thing that you have to understand about our family too is my great-grandfather worked in the post office his entire life for 20-something years, 30-something no, like years. 50 years. 50 he was, years. worked 50 years, never got promoted, and ended up suing the post office because of that and won the, won the lawsuit. And, and so that was kind of the environment. That was just the way it was. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, within a couple of generations now, you know, I went to Notre Dame and, and got this opportunity. Yeah. So it's just an unbelievable turnaround in three generations to see that. Um, and I think it's an active part on our parents, on my parents, on my grandparents, my great-grandparents, in choosing mercy and grace over hate, in choosing to, to see the opportunity for kids and then building that environment. Yeah. When I was growing up in your household, Dad, I never, ever saw limitations, and I think about all the things that you allowed me to do through basketball. You know, I've been able to travel, I've been able to receive this education and play ball at this level as well. But I think the greatest gift that you and Mom gave me and my brothers is the ability to think that we can do anything. I, and I think I'm in, gratefully indebted to you for that. Oh, thanks. So. Yeah. What? Well, you know. <laughs> uh, that's a no, sentimental you, moment think, that I'm, you know, I'm happy to share with all of my 3,200 closest <laughs> friends. But you no, know, it's, it's really, that, and I really have to say thank you all for coming here today and keeping this conversation alive. Because it, 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 as much as things have changed, things haven't changed. Mm. And, and it really takes an active conversation. It takes an active, you, you know, in order to, to, to have integration and to, to trust one another, it, it, you, you actively have to think about what are they experiencing, mm. right? And, and, and how do I be a blessing to them? And I think, uh, you know, that's, that's been my mentality when I, uh, you know, I, I gone to all these different neighborhoods as an NBA player and I see all these kids and, so many kids, I mean, it's just the way it's been built in our society. These kids are locked into these communities, you know, because of redlining and all these different policies and everything. They're stuck in these environments where they're not getting encouraged and they're not getting the opportunities. They go to poor, poor schools. They're not getting the education and the opportunities. And so, so for me, that's where my, my passion really comes from is how do I go in there and, you know, whether it's you know, Hispanics in South Texas. Mm. I mean, I see, I see them coming across the border, they're building their homes in these communities down in South Texas, and it's our job to make sure, because the population in Texas is growing so fast, the Hispanic population in 30 years is gonna be the dominant population in, in Texas. If we don't educate them, what does our economic outlook look like for Texas? What, is, what do we look like as a community? And so, so it's our job, I see it, it's incumbent upon us to say, hey, let's make better schools, let's give them opportunities, let's get them to college, and so that's, yeah, that's, that's what, what you managed to, to do with Carver Academy, and I kind of want to go through that, that mindset with you. You're towards the end of your career, you're going to Eastside San Antonio, yeah. and you see an opportunity to build a private school. Can yeah. you talk to me more about what made you want to start this Carver Academy, and what were your ideas, and what were the challenges that you experienced? Yeah, well, you know, for me, Education has always been the key. Uh, you know, um, George, Was George Washington Carver said, education is the golden key that unlocks the, the door to freedom. Mm. It's the key to unlock the golden door to freedom. And, and that's, I've always thought that. You know, if we can just open their eyes, if we can just get them to understand that the bigger world out there, why going to school, why learning is so magical. And, and so starting Carver Academy was really all about that, is about going into the east side of San Antonio and getting these kids who, and these families from single parent homes and these kids who were dropping out of school, starting them off at an early age, starting them off at four and five years old and saying, we're, you're gonna go to college. You're gonna go to college. I don't care what your situation is at home, we're gonna get you to college. And, and that, that was a mindset that just wasn't there. Yeah. And so now here we are 15 years later and we've built 20 new schools in San Antonio. We have 10,000 students. Over the last 15 years across Texas, you know, we built 61 schools across Texas. Mm. And we have 35,000 kids, and our goal is 100,000 by 2022. And so we're going to...
And we're going to send every single one of those gifts to college. We're going to send every single one. So that's, that to me is exciting. Yeah, and could you tell me more about when you went down to, because recently, when was the idea partnership? The idea partnership, we, we partnered with Idea Charter. I, st I started Carver as a private school because I wanted the faith-based component. I, I thought that was a really key piece of the puzzle for kids to understand that you're uniquely created. There's no mistake in who you are and where you are, right? God has created you uniquely for purpose and has given you the talents and the opportunities. And George Washington Carver is famous for saying, start where you are, use what you have, make something of it, and never be satisfied. And so that was our message to these kids. You can do anything you set your mind to, and, and we're, we're going to prepare you to do that. So that was what, what prompted us to start the Carver Academy. And um, so we started it with 60 kids, and we wanted small classes so we could get these kids caught up and, and excelling. And uh, we grew it out to sixth grade. And so for, what, eight years, we were a private school. And we had to raise about $2 million a year to keep it going. And then we joined up with IDEA as a charter school, and now it's allowed us to really grow and have great impact. Yeah, and I, want, I also attended Carver Academy. I'm telling you, it was rigorous. I'm in third grade taking German, Japanese, and Spanish. Like, it was amazing uh, experience. And then I wanna, I wanna learn more about the first time you went down to South Texas when you went to FAR, to that college yeah. gra uh, the high school graduation. Well, what yeah, was that like? La you know, last year I got a chance. We do, we do what, what's called a um, college signing day every year. So we have 22 schools down in South Texas, down the Rio Grande Valley in San Juan, Far, Donna, Texas. Um, and so I went down there for the college signing day. And it was much, you know, it was in an arena, um, 500 students from you know, four different schools walked across the stage and held up their banner in which college they were going to. Over half of them were first in their family to attend college. And it was just, it was crazy exciting to see really transformative moments for these families. You know, a lot of what we do, especially down the Rio Grande Valley, is convincing families, hey, you, you know, uh, families are saying, we got our, get, our kids have to work, we need money. And we're saying, no, they need to go to school <laughs> and come back and you guys will do way better. And so, um, so seeing these families all excited and they're in their Sunday best and they're seeing their kids, you know, hold up their banner, we're going to UT, the Rio Grande Valley, or we're going to Cornell, or we're going, you know, to Baylor. Amazing, amazing deal. And, mm -hmm. and so, like, for 14 years now, yeah. we've been able to have every single child walk across that stage and hold up a college. And it's amazing to me to see that you, you saw an opportunity and you were willing to go into the fray. I mean, I couldn't imagine going to Eastside San Antonio and saying, <laughs> looking yourself in the mirror every single day and saying, I have to raise $2 million a year in order to get these kids yeah, through I didn't realize education. I was signing up for that. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that but, came later. <laughs> but, but I'm interested to know more because we're talking about Grandpa, when he, with Little, Little Rock Nine, he decided not to, to engage in that battle. He didn't want to fight that battle. Yeah. You decided to fight the, the battle in Eastside San Antonio, and you continue to do so all around South Texas. The question is, when do you know which battles to fight and, and which to, to stay away from? Um, well, that's a tough question, right? It is a good question, yeah. Man, you know, you, you, the, thing I, the, the way I think about it is this. They're not my battles to fight, right? They're God's battles to fight. I, I think we, we take too much on our own shoulders, you know, for the, the winning and the losing. You know, being an athlete, I understand training, right? We train, and if you don't like to train, you're not going to be a very good athlete. And I think with our faith, it's the same way. You have to train. You have to train your faith. You have to practice grace and practice mercy and do it better and better every day. That's what I love about America because America is, it's an ideal. It's not, it, we're not even close to what we say we are, right? The land of the home of the free and the land of the brave. We're not even close, you know, but we're getting there. We're getting there. We're practicing. We're getting better. We're treating each other a little bit better. Over the years, we've grown up as a country and we continue to grow up. And we have a system that allows change. It allows us to grow into being America, being the, the, the bastion of the world that we, we have the potential to be. But we are not who we say we are. We have to practice. We have to continue to grow. And so t for me, it's all about just day by day, just practicing, right? Practicing grace. If, if there's an opportunity in front of me, that's what I take on. When I went to San Antonio, my ministry was the team. I mean, I didn't want to start a church. I wanted to go in that locker room and encourage those guys day in and day out and love on them and just show them that, hey, 
man, I just want the best for you. I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna see you grow and I wanna see you prosper. I wanna see you become the best husband you can be. I wanna see you become the best father you can be. And, and just show that love day in and day out. And then over the years, the guys started to actually believe me. <laughs> you know, like after a while, they were like, you're some, you know, at first they were like, you know, you're, you're such a goofball. But then after a while, they, they really kind of, they're like, okay, you know, David really likes me. He cares about me. But it took time, right? It took a lot of time. Because when he time. first came in, I mean, what was the environment like? They just lost, what, they won 20 games. Yeah. This my is, first year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're in danger of losing the team to another city, right? Is that yeah, the case? Yeah, so the, the team was about to move to another city. And, and, um, and here yeah, you are, we, this, this young military man all buttoned up coming into this locker room saying, I'm going to save San Antonio. <laughs> well, I didn't say I was going to save San Antonio. <laughs> but, the but the newspaper question, <laughs> said I was going to save San Antonio. So but what that was that good. like when you entered into this? I mean, you're, you're dealing with veterans, guys who have been in the league for 10, 12 yeah, years. Yeah. Guys who have had way more experience, who've played Michael, who played yeah. Magic. Guys, I mean, you were just playing college ball. Yeah. So how did you feel comfortable going into a new locker room and making a change. Yeah, no, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I think you have to start where you can, right? You know, start where you are, use what you have, make something of it and never be satisfied, right? So, and that's what I did. When I came into that locker room, the, the Naval Academy had taught me about discipline and about what was right and what was wrong. So I had no question about what I thought was supposed to be right and wrong. So, you know, I came in the locker room and, and I tried to set a tone. We had a bad culture. There's no two ways about it. We had guys, I mean, in all honesty, that first team that I came to back in 1988 had three guys on it that ended up going to jail. And so we had a bad culture. And, and so the first thing that was most obvious to me is we need to change the culture here in this locker room. We need to get guys to understand what professionalism is, with showing up on time and, you know, and doing our jobs and, and caring about one another more than we care about our next paycheck or care about, you know, our playing time or how many shots we get up. And so that was the challenge. And, and so I just tried to take a little bite at a time, what, whatever I could. When I came in the locker room, I said, look, you know, I respect the, the older guys, but I don't do business this way. And I'm going to do it the way I know how to do it. And the first year, yeah, when I came in the locker room, yeah, there were guys that moved their seats. They were like, hmm, don't want to talk to that guy. But over time, over time, I think they, they saw that I, I cared about what we were doing. And then you see how San Antonio went from this forgotten franchise to one of the most celebrated cultures in all of sports. Yeah. yeah so no, my, my question time. to you is, I mean, looking at what happened this summer, right? How, how do you want, obviously, San Antonio will be remembered as excellence, as culture, as people who care about each other, they do things the right way. We look at some of our heroes, like Dr. King Jr. Yeah. Um, and then obviously in August, we had a lot of issues around the country with monuments. How do we remember the Civil War heroes right, right. and those who did not you know, act yeah. so favorably towards well, minorities? I, I caution you all not to dig too deeply into uh, what we're doing in San Antonio. <laughs> 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 because, uh, you know, I know that, you know, people have brought up a lot of stuff about Dr. King's life and, you know, he's a hero. And, but then, oh, he was a human being and he made mistakes. But that doesn't mean he didn't inspire and encourage. And, and I, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater a little bit. I look around our country now and we're tearing down statues and everything. I mean, we did the best we could with what we knew at the time. Now we should be better. We should be smarter, right? So should we tear down monuments that honor people? I mean, those people were human beings. I mean, we got, we, we're responsible today to do better. Right? So like, that's our responsibility. You, you should have learned from the past. You should move forward in a, in a more intelligent way. And so, you know, for me, I look at Dr. King and, and I see just a great inspiration. He fought a good fight in a difficult time. How would I have done it? I have no idea. I don't know that I could have withstood the pressures that he, he, he did, but he, he laid a foundation for me to be able to build upon. And that's what I'm going to do. And I think all of our leaders try to do that. And, and do they have faults? Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, some faults more glaring than others, but, but we have to build on the foundation that's being laid for us, and we have to move forward. And that, you know, that's where I think we're stuck a little bit right now. Yeah, because we've had experiences, yeah. even at Notre Dame, I remember when I was 
a student here, there were discussions about the pictures and paintings in the main building. Right. With how, like, the colonial view of Native Americans depicted on the walls. Are we right. celebrating that? Are we remembering that? Do we take it down? Right. Do you educate people in saying this is not how we currently stand on the issue, but this is how it right. previously was thought of? So, at, yeah, at what point do you separate someone's humanity from their accomplishments? Yeah, that's and, a difficult question. I mean, you know, at what point does, does your you know, you do your mistakes really detract from your, your accomplishments. And for me, you know, I look at the Bible, and that's why I say practice grace and mercy. Because my big thing is, is I, you, you just got to love people. I mean, one of my heroes is King David from the Bible. And David killed a woman's husband and took the woman for his own wife. Like, that's a pretty bad deal. <laughs> you know, but God said about this man, this is, this is a man after my own heart. And so, if God says that about David, who am I to say David wasn't worthy of being a hero because he did these horrible things? So, I mean, I think it's, it, it's a fine line that we yeah. walk in. I think if you're going to err, err on the side of grace. Err on the side of mercy. Every single time. And, and, and I think you can't lose that way. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. We were talking earlier today, and, and you were saying how it's almost encouraging, right? Because if, yeah. if King David was that messed up, and he, <laughs> if he was and, that messed but, up. But I'm saying in the sense of he made mistakes. Right. And I'm a human being too. I make mistakes. We but have there's hope. still hope in, to inspire and change a generation right. and hopefully lead us into a next chapter right. where the next generation can then continue on our, on our foundation. Right. You don't have to be perfect. It's, it, there's no requirement. And, I, and that's a good, I try to communicate with, that with the boys all the time. I, I tell Corey and I tell David and Justin, you don't have to be perfect, but, but building a reputation takes a long time. It takes day after day after day of faithfulness. And guess what? One mistake could mess up a whole lot of good stuff, but just do the best you can, right? And, and, and just be faithful. And, and, you know, hopefully at the end of the day, they'll remember the things that you did in a positive way and, and it'll make a difference. But I think that long faithful walk, that long faithful practice is the key. Yeah. And I have two more questions for you as we close out. We're, we're shortened on time. One is, what do you want your memory to be? What, what do you want your legacy to be as an individual, as a father, as, as a basketball player, a philanthropist, et cetera? I, you know, I, I would go back to what I, what I said about King David. I would love for people to say that about me, that he was a man after God's own heart. That would, that would be the best thing that anybody could say about my life. That, um, because I, I don't... I don't the things that we've accomplished as a, as a San Antonio team or as a community or as a, as a school system or, or even as a family, I don't take credit for. I know that it's just solely by grace. And I would, I would hope that that's what people would, would see and say, I suppose. And then my last question is, what do you think about the, our generation for this? What do you hope for for, the, for our generation, for my generation? Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Y'all's generation, you have access to more things we couldn't even have dreamed about having access to the information. The world is changing at an incredible pace. I, I came last night, I got a ride from a, a Jordanian driver. Just, he's been here in the United States just recently. And, um, and you know, he was saying that how the world is changing in Jordan because they have a king. And he was saying that everyone always re revered the king. And now with social media and with access to information, everybody's like, oh, wait a second. He appoints all his cronies, uh, you know, he's not, you know, this isn't, this isn't, oh my goodness. Wait a second. So the world is changing so fast and, and you guys have incredible access to information and opportunity. And I think that your generation will impact this world more than all the generations past. And you have an opportunity to do some amazingly positive things or not. And with that, we'll wrap up and uh, thank you guys so much for having us. I think we're going to open up for questions. Right? Thanks. Thanks, David and Corey. I know you've given uh, all of us all, a lot to think about, but we are going to open the floor for questions now. Um, if you have a question for either David or Corey or both, just make your way to the microphone in the front of the stage, and um, we have a, a few minutes for, for Q&A. So step up to the microphone with your questions, please. If you would uh, say your name when you uh, step up to the microphone, we'd be grateful.
Is that Kaleem? <laughs> <laughs> My man. How you doing, guys? Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, and my name is Kaleem, as you said. Um, so just a quick question. Um, in light of the conversation about the murals and the monument, monuments and such, Notre Dame, we sell this family. And it's a family that I'm proud to be a part of. Um, so what's the balance between showing grace and mercy towards those on the murals or those individuals and welcoming them? individuals into our family just because I know that we have a Native American community that is deeply harmed. This is something that's at the front of our university. So what is the balance? Is there a compromise? Um, yeah. Just an open question. Yeah, there's, it's a great question and there's always a compromise. And, and I think it's our, it's our responsibility as children of God. If, if someone is going to be, be the the one who capitulates, it, it, it most likely should be us, right? If something is offensive to someone, take it down. You know, I mean, that's just kind of a general, right? If, that's, if you're practicing grace and someone is offended, take it down. Well, what's, you know, what's the problem? I mean, you know, it's, 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 to me, it's, it's, a, it's a balance, though, you know? So that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Hello. My Hi. name is Belle Shana Lucky, and I work for the Robinson Community Learning Center, okay. which is a part of the university. Fantastic. So you talk about the schools that you started, and working with education, it can be really frustrating, and I know that you said you started a private school and then changed to a charter. What did you do when you were faced with all of the challenges that the children are facing? How did you personally not get overwhelmed, but stay focused in the things that you have now been very successful, successful in? Wow. Um, that's a good question. Uh, how do we face the challenges? Um, you know, I believe in, in building blocks. Right? Like everything is, it, you have to have steps to growth and steps to improvement. And, and I think you, you have to identify the things that you can do right now and build on those things. And that's where, you know, as a school, when we built Carver Academy, we went in and we said, how can we be a, you know, most effective help with our limited resources? How can we be most effective help now? And so we built the school accordingly, and we've grown out as we've raised more money. We've, we've tried to address more issues. But, um, you know, you're always limited by resources and, and opportunity, and, um, and you just have to figure out what can I do with what I have right now? How can I most impact their lives? And so that's how I've always tried to approach it. And, and for me, for me personally, I, I think, the, like I, I said earlier, I think the faith component is a big deal. Right? Teaching people that that's, you gotta know who you are and where you come from and why it's important for you to even move in the first place. Yeah. And, and, and that's gonna be the motivation from beginning to end. If I, if I go to the NBA and I'm motivated by making more money or if I'm motivated by the things that constantly change, then I'm going to constantly change. And I noticed that about myself until I gave my life to the Lord. And when I gave my life to the Lord, there was one thing that motivated me. And everything in my life, all of a sudden, how can I be the best player? How can I be the best citizen? How can I be the best husband? How can I be the best father? Yeah. All that came from the same place. And, and it made life more manageable. And I didn't try to please people anymore. It was more about just being who God wanted me to be. And, and so my anxiety kind of left. I don't, I'm not trying to do the things in the community to have a good resume for you guys. <laughs> it's just not, I mean, what I'm doing, what I've done, God's pleased with. And so I have peace about that. And I'm, I'm going to just keep moving forward with it. So Yeah, and on a practical level as well, I, this summer I was in Uganda teaching, uh, as being a, like a TA for an art teacher, and I saw all these teachers who had a, like basically lived on campus six days a week. They, they did like 17-hour days. I mean, it was exhausting. And I saw a lot of people get burnt out. 
You know, because you're dealing, everyone wants something from you, and you're serving all day, all night. You have morning preps. People are waking up at four in the morning to teach courses before school, then teaching, and then grading all night, then teaching again, then running community, choir, basketball. I said, where's the time for you? And I think if you, one of the things I saw in Uganda that was really important is carving, even if it's 30 minutes, right, just for you, like your time that's protected where you can rejuvenate and pour into yourself, whether that's, like for our family, it's devotion, more faith-based. But even if it's time of meditation, just thinking, and, and really pouring into yourself, I saw that made a world of a difference and being able to give to others better and more effectively. So. Thank you very much. That's very encouraging. No, thank you. We have time for one more question. Hello, thank you so much for being here and I'm grateful to be here. My name is Esau Allen and I've worked here for 10 years. And my question is, with respect to Dr. King's legacy of love, peace, grace and mercy, how do you teach your sons to deal with today's society and the current president that we have? Yeah, no, that's a great question. How, how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we, and, and, and I, it's, just, it's the same thing. I mean, I think you, the, the real change lies in your hands. And that's what, I, that's what I've tried to teach them from the time they were little. You, you could spend your whole day worried about what they're doing in Washington. I, 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 you, could, you could stress out all you want about what they're doing in Washington, but the most important thing to you is what you're doing and what's happening around you, and the light that you're shining on the people around you. And, and that dwarfs what's happening in Washington. I mean, that, yes, should it be a concern? Absolutely. But if you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing, and you're impacting your community the way you're supposed to be, then your community is smarter, better, makes better decisions, elects better people, all that stuff. We're going to elect the people that the country wants. I mean. <laughs> Our elected officials reflect who we have. I mean, what people are saying and doing. That's it's it, it's a pretty good system we have. It really does end up getting people that represent the people. And so, you know, I think if you want to change something, change your own household, change your community. You know, and that's where I've tried to raise these boys to, you know, be much more immediate and much more present. Man, you want to. Show people what a family should be. If you don't go talk about somebody else's family, <laughs> like oh, I don't like their kid. Like, show me what your kids should look like. Show me what your wife, what your what your marriage should look like. And that, to me, that is the most powerful statement you can make. And you keep making that statement every day. It has an, it has a profound impact on the people around you. And, and I think we underestimate that sometimes. It's, it's, nowadays, it's easy just to write something on the on the internet or write some Twitter line. That stuff means nothing. You could Twitter all day, and it means nothing if your if your life doesn't back it up. Now I see all these athletes, and they talk about all this stuff. Well, my first question is, where has your money gone the last 25 years? Where is your what is your, what have you, what does your life look like? What does your family look like? And then I say, should I have listened to that guy? Or should I not listen to that guy, right? Because there's evidence. There's all this stuff that's laid down about whether, they, whether their voice even means something. Everybody's got a voice, but doesn't mean anything. And so, you know. Yeah, and I think when you were saying that before, like that, that battle is an everyday thing, and showing love, mercy, and grace isn't easy. I right. think a lot of people think that it's just like this going to be this fairy tale world where you're just like, oh, yeah, like I love others, do that. That's an everyday battle. You got to wake up and choose mm -hmm. to do the hard thing. Right, yeah. And yeah. it's not easy, like you're saying, like 25 years, put your money, you have your own kids to worry about. You want to do what you want to like, focus on in your community. But like you, you've managed to do an unbelievable job in saying, this is where my money is, this is where my heart is, and this is where my life stands. And well, I, I, well, I hope there's enough evidence to support the things that come out of my mouth. And that's what, I, I think that's what we should strive for. On that inspiring note, we've come to the end of this part of the program. I'd like to ask Father John to come back on stage to help me thank Corey and David. Corey and David, that conversation was all we could have hoped for. Thank you so much. I had the pleasure, and it was a pleasure, of working with Corey when he was student body president, uh, a great leader for the students. I now have the pleasure of working with David on the 
NCAA Basketball Commission, um, the problems of peace and justice seem manageable compared to the problems of college basketball that David and I are working on, but, but it's a real pleasure to know him. And I, I would just conclude, I think I speak on behalf of us all. We talked about grace and mercy, an abstract discussion or examples. I think the lives of each of you are wonderful examples of grace and mercy, and, and that's one of the most important messages we'll take away today. So thank you very much. We have a small token just to express our appreciation. David landed in Denver last night, had to drive all night to get here. He's borrowed clothes, but here, here they are uh, just being with us. So thank you very much, thank both you of so you. Much. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. you want to get in the middle, Father John? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. You can leave them or take them either way. Thank you again, David and Corey. In just a few minutes, we'll come to the close of our program. But before we conclude, I want to draw your attention to the artwork at your places. You may recognize the piece depicted. It's entitled Sacred Traces by Juan Sanchez, a prominent Puerto Rican American artist and community leader, and is displayed in the main lobby of the new Duncan Student Center. The university commissioned this piece to be a tangible, visible sign of our diversity as a community in all its vibrancy one of two such works that will have a home in the, new, in the new Duncan Center. The image of sacred traces that currently hangs in the, in the center will evolve to include student contributions with the final installation scheduled for late spring or early summer. On the other side of the print, you'll notice that we've created a space where you can reflect on your next step. We invite you to take the card with you as a memento of today's conversation and a sign of our common commitment to be a place of inclusion and true hospitality. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Barbara Escobar to offer our benediction. Barbara hails from Los Angeles. She's pursuing a master's in theological studies at Notre Dame, having an, earned an undergraduate degree in English language and literature from Mount St. Mary's. Please join me in welcoming Barbara. Before I begin, I would like to invite you all to close your eyes. Close your eyes and be present to yourself and be present to your brothers and sisters in this room. O oh God of justice, you have given us the beautiful gift of life and diversity of life. You have created each of us in your perfect image each with unique gifts that reflect your perfect love. We thank you for inspiring women and men like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who come from all nations and all cultures. Although we may call you by different names, we know that you are one and the same God, a God of love and mercy. In a world that is filled with hate and division, we beseech you to fill our hearts with compassion, with tenderness and zeal for justice. We pray for those who suffer daily in wars, who face discrimination, and victims of hate crimes and acts of terrorism. May you bring them comfort. We pray for all those who struggle to have their voices heard in oppressive societies. May you bring them freedom and strength. And we pray that, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we may have the fortitude and wisdom to continue the work your Son Jesus left us to do on earth. Grant that we may follow your perfect way of love and become to become committed to living out your heavenly kingdom on earth by making the world a better place. Grant that we may establish in our lives and in our world a brother and sisterhood, a kingdom of understanding and unity, 
where both men and women from all parts of our diverse world will live together as brothers and sisters and respect the dignity and worth of every human being. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in our common band of humanity in the kingdom of our Lord and of our God. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. And thanks again to David and Corey, to Father John, to Hosnia, and to all who contributed to today's conversation. I also want to acknowledge the teams who worked so hard to make this day possible, including Campus Dining and the Joyce Center team. Please join me in thanking everyone with one last round of applause. Finally, we're deeply grateful to each one of you for being part of today's conversation. Our luncheon concludes, but may we each continue to walk the walk. Again, thank you, and I wish you a good afternoon. <laughs>